Welcome to Health and Harmony Beyond the Teeth, where we dive into all subjects that will help you become healthier and happier. As a dentist, I believe dentistry is more than just teeth. So I created this show to focus on overall health. We will hear from leading experts about eating better, exercising better, breathing better, and sleeping better. We want to help you create harmony in your life so you can live your life to the fullest. We want you to thrive. So we're back with Ben Moralia. Uh, Dr. Moralia has been with us for the last several episodes uh, talking about uh, poor breathing, breathing techniques, uh, the cause of, of poor breathing, which is underdeveloped jaws, how that affects sleep, some of the uh, uh, symptoms that occur from poor sleep and poor breathing, uh, bedwetting, asthma. Um, there's also uh, in this country, uh, I, I can speak for this country, but I'm sure it's worldwide, a uh, exorbitant amount of children and adults that are diagnosed with ADD or ADHD, which is nothing more than a, 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 a set of symptoms <clears throat> that people develop, and it puts them in this category. And what's sad is once you're in that category, it's kind of like you're there. There's nothing you can do about it except for take medication. And uh, we know that there's a huge correlation between sleep related breathing disorders, which are for the most part brought on by underdeveloped jaws and poor breathing, there's a relationship between that and ADD and ADHD, which also these kids, you know, specifically kids in school use their behavioral issues, or a lot of them have behavioral issues, not, not all of them, there are kids with ADD that don't have behavioral issues, they're good students, uh, but they're, they may be, um, you know, they're not reaching their potential or they're not learning like they should because of this condition. So um, I'd like, Ben, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how jaw development related to breathing, related to sleeping and how that affects uh, kids with, uh, or how that creates this symptom that we call ADD or ADHD. Yeah, I'm happy to share that too. Uh, same thing, I didn't invent it, but mm -hmm. I, I, did, I did learn a lot about it over the years. And one of the primary researchers that uh, I um, learned probably the most from was Dr. Karen Bonnick. Uh, Dr. Karen Bonnick is out of um, Yeshiva University, Albert Einstein in New York City, uh, and she is an epidemiologist. She did a wonderful study that was published in 2012, and I would refer parents to, to look into this. You can Google uh, Dr. Karen Bonick is B-O-N-U-C-K. You can Google her and childhood sleep disorder breathing. And when you do, and you can YouTube also, there are a lot of interviews where she kind of describes her research. No one better than to share her research than her. So she's interviewed quite a bit. There's a lot of YouTube out there to watch and see her describe. I'll give you a kind of a very quick summary of her research. In 2012, she published a study that followed 11,000 children for six years. So they followed 11,000 children for six years, and basically what they learned was that, hey, there is a relationship between the sleeping breathing issue and the behavior the next day. So what they learned was that the children in the sleep disorder breathing category, now we use the word sleep disorder breathing until you have an actual diagnosis. So you could be mouth breathing or snoring or have obstructive sleep apnea. Those could be like a specific diagnosis. Sleep disorder breathing is what you're using to describe a child who is sleeping and they're not nose breathing silently and invisibly. So if you're breathing with your nose silently and invisibly, perfect, that's the right breathing pattern. Other than that, you're a sleep disorder breathing patient until you have the actual diagnosis, which category do you land in? So from mouth breathing to snoring to obstructive sleep apnea, that's your sleep disorder breathing group. So what she learned by following these kids over six years um, that, well, interesting things in both the behavioral and the cognitive categories. So we, we end up learning both from her. So in the behavioral category, there is a significant relationship between the sleep disorder breathing kids having behavioral issues and social issues during the daytimes, whereas in the category of children who were normal and healthy nasal breathers at night, they didn't have these symptoms. The other category was the cognitive, and we talk about cognitive, fancy word, but academics, we could think about IQ. In her study, they were IQ testing the children throughout the study. What they learned was that the children in the sleep disordered breathing had lower IQs. So there's research in all of these categories from other people too, doctors uh, David and Leila Gozal. 
have research out there on childhood sleep disorder breathing that also supports this. So Dr. Karen Bonick isn't the only one. But what we learned from her, and she was one of the first ones I learned it back in 2012, was that a child who is sleep disorder breathing, meaning not breathing well through their nose, mouth breathing or worse, is likely to have a lower IQ than a child who breathes well through their nose. So it has a cognitive you know, debilitating effect on a child. We'll have a lower IQ or academic struggles we might see during school. The other category was the behavior. That was really where her research was more significantly focused in that the children who have sleep disorder breathing came in with diagnoses of having the ADHD and or behavioral issues during the day. One of the parts of her project was related to the OSA category where you had obstructive sleep apnea. In the obstructive sleep apnea category, if a child had obstructive sleep apnea as a diagnosis, so having obstructive sleep apnea is a very severe condition. If the child had obstructive sleep apnea and then the parent and the school were asked to fill out the so-called ADHD forms uh, to, to evaluate for that diagnosis. In her research project where it was 11,000 kids over six years, a child that had the OSA diagnosis then had parent and school fill out forms they did have the symptoms for the ADHD at a rate of 100%. So that's an interesting finding in that, you know, you're looking for, for the ADHD diagnosis, typically it's six symptoms for six months from two sources. So the parent will get forms, the school will get forms, and if they have six symptoms for six months, you're well on your way to a diagnosis. Well, the, the kids who had an OSA diagnosis, when those forms were filled out by parent and school, Dr. Bonick's research showed that that was a very significant and high rate in the 100% mark of having the ADHD symptoms. Then of course that range was 40 to 100 and when you go down to 40 it was when the symptoms were more mild like a mouth breathing or snoring. In the mouth breathing or snoring category there were kids who had the ADHD diagnosis but the overwhelming category was in the OSA category. A child who struggles the most to breathe typically has the behavioral issues. So we think about behavior the next day. Well let's think about adults first. If you have the example of sleep deprivation, so we think about, okay, a newborn, you bring a newborn home and you're going to be sleep deprived for an amount of time. Well, I like to say the word cranky. If I'm sleep deprived for an amount of time, I become cranky, but I'm an adult. So I know that my behavior, you know, kind of matters. I have to behave myself in public, but it's different when you're a child <laughs> and you're a little more free flowing. And in the same manner, kids say anything, and you know, kids say the darndest things, right? <laughs> you know, when your six-year-old runs up and gives grandma a hug and says, grandma, your teeth are yellow. You know, that's, <laughs> it's a harmless comment, but grandma's going to be wrecked over it. And the kid is just free flowing with the words, but they're also free flowing in the behavioral category. So an adult would know, you don't go up and say hi to grandma and say, hey, oh, grandma, your teeth are yellow. <laughs> An adult can know better kind of what to say. Although some of us speak poorly and maybe <laughs> maybe say the wrong thing. I'm, I've been guilty of saying the wrong thing on a number of occasions. but Just ask his wife, right? <laughs> yes. Ask the wife, ask the kids. They'll tell you how many times I have misspoken, so to speak. But in the, in the behavior category, okay, an adult who doesn't get a good night's sleep for many nights like sleep deprivation with an infant at home, you're going to become a little cranky and maybe you do become, we use the word short. Instead of you know, there's a problem presented to you and instead of taking the long route of an explanation and being hand-holding and doing it beautifully, you might say, just get out of here. I can't deal with that right now. Short or cranky be words to describe how an adult might behave. But a child gets a poor night's sleep because their breathing was bad. But that's not one night. It's multiple. It's going from one to two to three to a week to a month to a year. When your anatomy is small and you don't breathe well, it's not one night out of a week or two nights. It's every night you're breathing poorly. You're sleeping poorly. So if you're sleep fragmented or sleep deprived, basically, you don't have a good night's sleep, your brain hasn't done its job to clean and reset you for the next day, you are gonna have a behavioral issue. And the pathway to that is that we see hyperactivity built into there. So there's a sequence of events. When the brain doesn't get to do its job well throughout the entire night because it was focusing on the breathing and it's trying to get good breathing going, so it doesn't get to do the rest and digest. Come morning time, the brain realizes, hey, wait, the sun's coming up, so the body knows at sunrise I'm supposed to be waking up. So you got this wake cycle going, meaning the waking is coming because we are basically a daytime awake and a nighttime asleep type thing. So we have half of us wants to wake up because the sun's coming up, we're supposed to wake up. But the brain didn't get to do its cleaning job and it doesn't want you to wake up to an unclean house. We talked about hoarding. So we got this unclean house, I didn't get to repair the, recharge the child for the day. So what the brain does is it releases ingredients to keep you asleep longer. 
And that explains why the child has struggles to get out of bed in the morning. The slow rise, the trouble getting rolling, the early morning really tired. We didn't sleep well through the whole night. So we go to bed at a certain time on the clock, eight o'clock. If our sleep is fragmented or broken all night long, we have very bad sleep. The quality of sleep is terrible. Come morning, well, you're definitely tired. You're definitely struggling to get going. But now what's happening is the brain is actually trying to keep you asleep saying, wait, I got to catch up. Let me finish cleaning you. But to clean you, I got to have you sleeping. It releases ingredients to make you sleep more. So now the parent might describe, oh, we have trouble waking in the morning. We have trouble getting up and getting dressed and getting breakfast and getting to school on time. We miss the bus. We're late to school. We're not only cranky, but we're having a tantrum. That's a description of having the brain trying to keep the child asleep longer to finish its job. Well, when the body's trying to wake up, it's getting ingredients to wake up, but the brain's trying to keep you asleep. Well, when the brain's trying to keep you asleep, guess what the, the body's doing? Because the sun is coming up. The body's saying, wait a second, it's daytime, I gotta get up. So this is like a seesaw going on. So what's happening is the brain is ahead of, of the game, so the child falls back asleep early morning, they crash, but then the body knows it's gotta get up, it has to give you more ingredients to wake you up. So you get more of the stimulants, so to say, so to speak, to get you up. Now, the brain says, no, wait a second, I'm not done. It releases more of, of the, the sleeping ingredients. I got to keep that child asleep. So the, the waking cycle says, no, 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 it's time to wake up. We got to get going. The sun's up. The daytime gets started. So now you have this increase in these ingredients. Well, the waking eventually wins. So you have this struggle in the morning. But over these hours, what's happening is in order to keep the child awake, because when you don't sleep at night, you want to fall asleep. You want to take a nap. To keep the child awake, the ingredients overflow the child. And this is where you get your hyperactivity. Mm. The hyperactive component is all the adrenaline being pumped into that child to beat the sleep cycle. Because no. the, the brain is trying to make you sleep longer to finish its job. Yeah. It doesn't care the sun's coming up. So the brain doesn't care the sun's coming up. I got to finish my job. It's very important. But the wake says, no, no, we have to get up and go. So now you get all these ingredients will flood and it wins out. So when it wins out, that's the middle of the day where the hyperactivity, where's the child at school? So they're bouncing off the walls. They can't sit in a desk. They run around, they move too much. They're not sitting still. That child is hyperactive. The parent calls, the school calls the parents says, look, your child's too hyperactive for us. They're moving around too much. They're disruptive in the school. You go to the physician. These are all real symptoms. The child is hyperactive. The child does have these symptoms. And if it becomes six of the symptoms in six months from two sources, you kind of have your diagnoses to get treated in the symptom category, medication. But if you have underdeveloped anatomy leading to poor breathing, disrupting or fragmenting your sleep at night, you're not well rested, you're in a sleep right. deprivation category. What you're thinking about then is, well, if we have attention issues, if we have behavioral issues, if we have acting out, if we have that list of symptoms so-called in the ADH category, I think more about now in the sleep deprived category. Okay, let's put aside the ADHD diagnosis. Let's think about if I was sleep deprived, would that be? And it turns out that list is very similar. If you're looking at those lists and you're a parent who has a child and you've seen those lists, that might be the list you would get if you were deprived of your sleep for an amount of time. So I go back to same thing like bedwetting or night sweats or asthma or the behavioral category or the academic category, struggles in school. I look at that list and I say, I, my priority is to work on the anatomy. I'm not treating any of those symptoms. I don't treat bedwetting. I don't treat night sweats. I don't treat ADHD. I don't treat you know, behavior. I don't treat hyperactivity. I don't treat academic struggles. What I do is I back it up to the sleeping is poor. Could that be from the breathing being poor? The breathing, nose, nurse's mouth? Okay, is there anatomy underdeveloped? Do I have underdeveloped jaws? Because most children come in having had the early soft diet, most children have underdeveloped jaws and will not grow enough to realize 32 teeth in place without attention. So I work in the malocclusion space, my fancy word for underdeveloped jaws. If I develop the child's jaws at an early age and our treatments exist from age three all the way, but early you get involved, develop the jaws, make more airspace or airway room, then the breathing can be flipped from mouth to nose. And then if you can breathe through your nose all of a sudden, you sleep better. And if you sleep better, you become a better student. Academics become easier for you. We've had all those categories. We've had behavior. I've had both categories. I've had children who come in where they've been recommended to have the medication. If we treat the jaw growth and development, get the breathing and sleeping right, they never get the medication. 
I've had children come in on medication already. I've had the wonderful experience of helping them get off the medication because if we would treat in the cause category, grow the jaws, get the nose breathing, get the sleeping, they can fade away from the medication as the symptoms go away. So with the medical community's help, they wean them off the medicine. So I've, I've had experience in both categories. Basically, I live in my lane, which is to treat underdeveloped jaws. I treat underdeveloped jaws. And as I do that, I get to see over, now it's more than a decade of of paying attention to bedwetting going away, asthma going away, night sweats going away, nightmares, night terrors going away, um, the behavioral symptoms going away, students flipping from I struggle in school and I have all these tutors and aides to help me get by to I'm a straight A student with little effort. I can absorb it all and learn really well. And all of that really stems from a good night's sleep, which comes from better breathing while you're sleeping, which comes from is your anatomy set up to breathe well. So better jaw growth and development translates into a well-behaved child. In my experience, that has been my pathway to helping those kids. Yeah, excellent. So we, we live in a society where we want to give medication because it's a, you know, an instant fix. And um, there's, just a, there's a much better way out there, much, much better way. And for all you parents out there or for yourself, even if you're an adult, um, if you have any of these symptoms, uh, there's, there is a way this can be treated. So get checked out. Uh, find, a, find a good uh, airway, uh, you know, like a functional medicine dentist. Uh, that's, what, that's what I call it. There's not really an official name for what we do, right. but, but that's the best way that I would look at it because functional medicine is all about treating the cause, and that's exactly what we do. I've, I've, um, I, I didn't really model my practice after Dr. Moralia's, um, but, but I did. It, it just happened when we met. Our practices are very similar, very, very similar. So I would say I have a practice like he has because he's been practicing this type of, di of dentistry, functional medicine dentistry longer than I have. But just in the short time, you know, the last five, seven years that I've been doing this, I've seen, um, I mean, I could tell stories. And I know Dr. Morali has seen uh, a lot more patients than I have. And uh, he sees this stuff, it works. Um, we're all about treating the cause, all about treating the cause, because that's going to create a lifetime of health and a, and, a, and a longer health span, as we discussed in one of our previous episodes. So, um, Ben, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of great information. Uh, if you have any questions about any of this, you can contact uh, Dr. Mar Moralia through the Airway Health Solutions uh, dot com. What is the name? Your do you have a, a practice uh, website or would that just go through okay. Airway Health Solutions? Yeah, the educational component is uh, www.airwayhealthsolutions.com. Right. My private practice is in um, Mount Kisco, New York, and that would be under Doctors Brown, Getz, and Moralia. Brown, so Getz, and Moralia. Yeah, okay. it's a full right. name of the office. That's okay. where I practice. Okay. Uh, for people in this part of the country, they can go to halstuart.com or the Stewart Center for Optimal Health. Um, we would love to see you. We'd love to help you. We'd love to help your kid, your children, uh, and, and um, any of your loved ones because we know this stuff works and we feel very passionate about it. So, Ben, I want to thank you again for being with us. Uh, it's been a great series, and uh, hopefully we'll have you back uh, in, in, uh, at later time and, and maybe come up with some more topics. That discussion. sounds great. Yeah, thank All you very right. much. It was my pleasure. Thank you for yeah. having me. All right. It's been uh, Dr. Ben Moralia. I'm Dr. Hal Stewart with Health and Harmony Beyond the Teeth. Have a great day.